There were a million things that changed as American horror entered its adolescence. Perhaps the most important shift was in perspective. The great envelope-pushing horrors of the Truman and Eisenhower years were about invasions from above, below, and inside. Can't you see? They're after you! They're after all of us! Our wives, our children, everyone! They're here already! You're next! And thus there were, due in no small part to the fact that steady, tripod, and dolly-mounted cameras were an inescapable part of the grammar of American movies, solid, unyielding frames to be invaded. William Cameron Menzies' great contribution to science fiction was undeniably his design sense, but he also brought to the genre a sense of a futurist frame. His camera wouldn't move often when he could help it. He would instead, as Menzies' biographer James Curtis points out, use the frame to suggest movement through time and through space. Invaders from Mars is told from the perspective of a child, and so the designer, used to bending sets to the warped perspectives of his characters, created a world of enormous imposing shapes, of terrifying wraiths moving towards the camera, in effect rendering each of us a helpless child in the audience, watching without hope of changing anything. As studios spent less money on horror, but more and more people wanted to make and watch horror and sci-fi, the innovations of the 50s and 60s were used as crowbars to another realm of voyeuristic pleasure and fear. Soon the camera itself became an even more intrinsic part of the idea of the horror film, literally letting you assume the point of view of a killer or a victim, heightening the erotic connection between a cinematic artifact and its viewer. This is where Texan filmmaker Toby Hooper came along. Hooper saw his fair share of American horror cinema over the years, but formally speaking, he didn't appear to be inspired by directors like William Cameron Menzies. Menzies, a painter and graphic designer, said everything with a frame. A frame was a complete statement. And the director tapped into a childhood spent in Scotland feeling alienated as an American in a foreign country, surrounded by the imposing wildness and the mythic character of the landscape whenever creating his cinematic worlds. Hi. Who are you? I'm Dr. Blake, Davies. What kind of doctor? I'm not sick. I know you're not, but Sergeant Finley said you had a story to tell. A confidential story. Doctors are sort of like ministers. You can tell them anything. Hooper was altogether a different kind of filmmaker. With the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, his definitive rewiring of the American horror film's DNA, the true coming of age of the American horror film, the camera tells the story, not the frame. The camera leads us further into a terrible mystery, introducing the world a little at a time, and then just as suddenly trapping us. It gives, it takes away. An object or idea is suddenly placed in a wider context, and just as easily can become lost to the world. Hello? 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 Hey, Pat, come look at this. What? No! Hello? Anybody home? Hello? Hey, Pam. Hello? This is a style much more in keeping with the more voluptuous likes of Hooper's peer, 
Francis Ford Coppola, or Max Ophuls. Défense de lever le bras avant mon commandement, feu. Ne pas tirer après trois. Le premier coup pour l'offenser. Bien sûr. Not horror filmmaking at all until Hooper got done with it. When Toby Hooper made the controversial decision to remake Invaders from Mars in 1986, it came after his choice to make a remake of a different sort. Armed with a slyly perverted and action-forward script, Hooper turned Colin Wilson's novel The Space Vampires into a triplicate tribute to the films concerning Nigel Neal's character Bernard Quatermass, made by the renowned Hammer Horror Studio. It was what I was afraid of. The thing got a huge intake of energy. The very substance of it seemed to be coming alive. And then... You can't see this world any longer. I feel it. The process of conversion releases a life energy, and it can be collected. Collected? Is that what the umbrella is? Collector? The energy doesn't go free. It goes up there. Military men and men of science solving a supernatural crisis before all of England is swallowed by a Lovecraftian entity here to supplant human consciousness. Hooper took the English approach to dramaturgy a much more rational approach than the American science fiction of the 1950s, and presented it with his live visual storytelling. In essence, he brought the 50s into the 80s as an ironic counterpoint to the resuscitation of the Red Scare of the 50s, the fear stoked in newspapers and by politicians and in movies that communism was coming to destroy America. <coughs> What are you doing, David? Hammer! David Gardner! Stop! 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 Right! Remaking Invaders from Mars, he tried a similarly rational approach. With characters, especially the much more modern young hero, Hunter Carson's David Gardner, working overtime to make sense of the invasion, which still has the gleefully childlike imagery of Menzies' original. Knocked over a defenseless little girl. But I... And he's a little snoop. Please, Mrs. McCouch, why don't we just talk with each other? Give him to me. Please let me talk to him. David, go inside my office. You're pushing it, sister. I'll be back for him in five minutes. Five minutes! It's okay, David. Just relax. Relax! You don't understand. What? 
What don't I understand? You know, David, that whatever you tell me stays in this room. I'm a nurse, you know, I'm here to help. I mean, I'm supposed to say that, but it really is true, David. Okay, first, can I see the back of your neck? David, that's some kind of story. It's not a story. Hooper's Martians have a grotesque tactility, and the film's vision of the invasion has a much more depressive characterization to go with a decade of American politics where artists were rightly suspicious of a government run by a movie star dismantling free states all over the world in the name of the ever-nebulous concept of freedom. I would rather see my little girls die now, still believing in God, than have them grow up under communism and one day die no longer believing in God. Menzies' film, like a lot of 1950s science fiction, can be read as a sort of Rorschach blot metaphor for the Red Scare in America. His heart action is unnaturally fast. It's too soon to tell, but there's every symptom of polio and I'm having him removed to the isolation ward in the general hospital. No, he has to go with us. If he's better in the morning, we'll discuss it then. Now, you listen to me. We don't want you telling a lot of those idiotic stories. Understand? George, you know we can't leave him here. We have to Shh. take him. Never mind. He can't be helped now. Come on. What would happen if the people around you suddenly turned red? Today, the most dangerous enemy agent is not so much concerned with the secret information about weapons as he is with infiltrating the necessary departments of the government and shaping and controlling the actions of our nation so that the enemy is progressively winning, winning without even firing a single shot. Hooper's Invader is a movie about a child who no longer believes what the adults in his life tell him. Everything's fine now. Thanks. Our pleasure. Goodbye, man. Hooper's hero is a kid who sees that America's conscience has been invaded, and even though he calls adults for help, there is no help coming. The authorities, whatever form they've taken, have already won. A happy ending is little more than a nice dream before awaking to a life in America. The ultimate nightmare. Sending in the military won't do anything but create a higher body count. Feel better now, Vicky? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Better get some sleep. You'll be pretty yeah. tired at school tomorrow. Mm. Good night, son. But the real attraction the movie has to offer isn't a subtextual revision, but rather Hooper's magnificent moving camera, revealing a world of glowing and buzzing carnality after an intro filled with creeping paranoia. David Gardner is brought into the treacherous world of adulthood too soon, and so are we, divining the shape of the horror an inch at a time as Hooper's camera discovers it all in front of us. Hooper didn't remake Invaders from Mars to update its effects, but rather to speak to audiences in a different language, to use movement instead of merely suggesting it, to translate something wonderfully antique into a post-classical Hollywood landscape, to make opera out of a child's dream, but of course, to tell people that the more things changed, the more they stayed the same.